My name is Jeremy, and this is Good Beer Matters. Asia as a general rule of thumb is that food and alcohol are synonymous. It's a product showing that you have international culture, you like a refined product. There's a vibrancy in Asia that is pretty much gone from most of the U.S. with the exception of maybe parts of New York City. For years, I've heard about Southeast Asia as a place where one could live well for dollars a day, where the life people dream of is actually tangible. What began as an interrupted conversation about diving and life as an expatriate took a turn into the heart of darkness to find craft beer in Southeast Asia. We find great experiences at the intersection of craft and culture. These are the stories of us, of great food and the beer that brings it all together. For the craft and culture of beer, this is episode 131 of Good Beer Matters with Chris Roberts of Heart of Darkness Brewery in Vietnam. Chris, you and I met in uh, one of the uh, most fun ways that um, that I can imagine in the beer world. We're at a, the beer conference, the Craft Brewers Conference in Nashville. You and your uh, friend happen to be sitting there, uh, and I was doing something else nearby, and I'm eavesdropping on you guys because that's what you do when you're at a beer conference and there's three people in a uh, in a rare, quiet space, and you start talking about diving. And, and I had to chime in. So we started, to, so we're there for beer, but we started talking about diving. And next thing you know, we're on a podcast now. And, and that is, that is a great lead into what we're going to be talking about today. Sounds good. Yeah. And it was a good thing we were talking about something uh, appropriate at the time. <laughs> well, because every, everyone's talking about beer at the Craft Brewers Conference in Nashville. So that, that was not the, the conversation that would uh, perk your ears up, but, but it's, it's fun to find your your tribe in, in amongst a larger tribe. Mm-hmm. But uh, Chris, thank you for coming on to the Good Beer Matters podcast. Uh, and I can't wait to, uh, I was going to say, tell people your story. I'm going to ask you to tell people your story and, and invite us around. First, uh, please introduce yourself and tell us uh, who you are, what you do. Sure. My name is Chris Roberts. I am the uh, chief business development officer or head of sales in normal American lingo uh, for Heart of Darkness Brewery, which is a brewery in Saigon, Vietnam. Uh, I'm sitting at my house in uh, Rayong, Thailand, uh, which is where I live. Uh, Prior to this, I was head of international sales for Ballast Point Constellation Brands working out of the Hong Kong office. Uh, I've been in the beer industry on the international side for about 12, 13 years now. Uh, prior to that, uh, I was uh, working in Tokyo. Uh, I am a lawyer, uh, although I don't thankfully practice that much. Uh, I was working in Tokyo on sort of the financial consulting side of, of life. Yeah, so you're, so you're brewery. working at beer, so you're the good kind of lawyer. <laughs> well, uh, at that time, I was finance, so yeah. global financial crash. <laughs> well, and, and I'm talking about now, you're still a lawyer, but you're working in beer, so everything's cool. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I only am probably 3% law, uh, but only <laughs> when I have to look at contracts. Yeah, perfect. Um, so before, I, I, I do want to ask about the brewery, because uh, yes. I, I love the name. I love the imagery you have and everything. Um, but before I do, I, I can't. I can't resist the temptation to find out, you know, it, it's for those of us in the United States that work in the beer business, you know, the beer business is beer as usual. I mean, we're, we've got the three tier system. We've got uh, you know, all the stuff that we're used to. I mean, uh, we have a, we, what, what we know as the beer business we take for granted, but you're talking about in the international beer business, I, I right out of the bat, I want to find out what from your experience is different in the international side of the beer business than what we'd expect to find in the U S. Uh, the U S is really the global unicorn because of prohibition. Uh, the three-tier system, which is a result of prohibition and the Volstead Act and all those fun things, uh, is the only country on the planet that has a three-tier system um, that I'm aware of anyways. I've been working in all of them. Um, and it's the only one where things like tap contracts and, and things of that nature, i.e. pay-to-play, uh, mm-hmm. is theoretically not legal. Obviously, there's ways around it in the U.S. that have you know, certainly happen. Yes. But that is standard practice for the rest of the world to have tap contracts uh, and other ways of, you know, uh, contractually getting your beer onto customer accounts. 
which which is an incredible thing to say because uh you know the craft beer movement started in the US but the environment was right where uh th- theoretically practically speaking uh everyone everyone had the right to go in and earn that tap handle uh it wasn't uh it, there were again theoretically practically speaking right. there were no tied houses in the US right. um anyone in the beer business will kind of mm, uh, we'll see that's a different conversation different day <laughs> but around the world the craft beer around the world, uh, because there is that pay to play, uh, scheme still out there, it's harder for these craft brewers to really start, make a dent, get out there, get the traction they need so they can then start building momentum. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, without question. And I mean, obviously it depends on like the country and the customer base, but there's many places where the only way that you can get your beer on an account is by paying thousands and thousands of dollars a month for the tap line. Uh, which is obviously not something a craft brewer is going to do because they're negative on the ROI. Um, yeah. So that does restrict the type of accounts that you would be in uh, or potentially available to be in because a lot of those bar owners, frankly, they make their profit off of tap contracts. Hmm. Which, uh, in, if we flip that coin uh, completely around, mm-hmm. then as a consumer trying to go out to these places, to, I, mm-hmm. I want to taste something local, uh, you're probably not going to find it very easily. Is that fair to say? Uh, yeah, uh, although, I mean, the big boys are not stupid either, right? So they often look, if you look at their global acquisitions, use ABI, for example, right? They'll have ABI's global brands like Corona and Budweiser. Um, they'll have their local craft brands that they've, either, that they've acquired. And then they'll sure. have their international craft brand, like say a Goose Island, for example. Sure. So even though the house is tied to ABI, you'll have... The ABI local, if it's Korea, it would be hand and malt, for example. So they okay. would have macro, macro international, uh, local craft, international craft, all in that tied house. But you and I both know that is just the perception of, of yeah, choice, absolutely. not the reality. Yes. No, choice. no, no. If you're looking for actual choices, oh, some countries are better than others, of course. Okay. Uh, I, they're more inclined to own their own taps. Um, but no, there's a, absolutely a, a, a perceived choice that really isn't one. <laughs> yes. Uh, which, you know, which, you know, to me, it just makes me think about maybe I should be grateful. It's like going to in and out where you've got uh, three choices of burgers. You know, it's uh, the double or the single or, or the animal style. And, 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 and we're all going to be happy. Um, so maybe it's not as bad as it sounds, but, but that does make the American in me cringe a little bit about you know, having things um, uh, tied up so that the the freedom isn't there to do business as we as we have the sorry to have the opportunity to do the business that we want. You're right. Uh, although I've I'm an American too, uh, and I've always somewhat thought businesses should have the right to contract with whoever they want to contract with. Um, yeah. So from like a, a legal principle perspective, I've always kind of thought it was weird that two businesses couldn't have a relationship. Uh, in the U.S., um, although from the consumer perspective, it's absolutely better that they don't. But yeah, it's sort of a dichotomy in my my legal brain and my consumer and, and beer selling brain. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting too. I mean, if if you and I were exchanging uh, other you know widgets and services mm-hmm. and uh, you know vehicle parts, when you know, I, I mean, I'm not passionate about vehicle parts. Are you? Uh, so if if we were exchanging vehicle parts for money, then yeah, we need a contract. But the thing that I love. And it's a good and bad if you want to look at it closely Mm -hmm. enough. Um, The beer business is a relationship business. This is why you and I are talking today. This is why anyone, any of you who are listening or watching, it's why you're listening or watching today, because it's a relationship driven business and beer just happens to end up in the center of that relationship. Um, And so it's a kind of a conundrum to think about uh, you have all these business ventures that turn beer into a commodity when from the very beginning, it was meant to be a source of a relationship builder. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, when you have, what, 8,500 breweries in the U.S. or, you know, we don't have as many in our neck of the woods, but the reason that the decision maker at the bar will go on premise tends to put your beer on is because they have a positive relationship with someone in the brewery. Yeah. Um, speaking of the brewery, uh, tell us about Heart of Darkness. Sure. So, and, 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 and start with the name too. I, I love the name. 
Okay, so the the primary founder, as in the operational founder and CEO, uh, John Pemberton, he is a was a bit of a, a of a genealogical mutt in that he had an Aussie passport and a British passport, and at one time an American passport even. Uh, Sounds but, like Jason Bourne. Uh, yeah, I do that with bags of currencies actually. But uh, <laughs> uh, he is more or less a Brit, and his favorite book was Joseph Conrad's book, A Heart of Darkness. Okay. Okay. Um, he was primarily a China worker. By that I mean working in China uh, on the sourcing side of the world, uh, and he was in Vietnam running IKEA's. Uh, Vietnam operation, which is where they make most of their wood products uh, for most of the UK stores or IKEA, depending okay. on how you want to pronounce it. Um, and he and a few partners back in oh in fifteen, uh, he was a home brewer. The sort of the usual uh, background on that one. Uh, yeah. He was a home brewer, had some friends, and they decided to open up a brewery in Saigon, uh, and they wanted a name that had ties to Vietnam, but it wasn't like a Vietnamese name. Uh, and they sort of stumbled upon or fell into a heart of darkness, which is of course the inspiration for the movie Apocalypse Now. Uh, oh, so oh okay, I didn't know that. favorite book and the localization through that use as Apocalypse is now a base story. And, and so is it meant to uh, honor the book and the, 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 the literature side of things, or is it meant to kind of honor uh, the the story. It, it's been a long time since I've read that story, so I, I'm going to plead the fifth on that one. But uh, it's a tough read, actually. I mean, it's written in the late 1800s, late 1895, yep. 96, uh, by a Polish chap writing in a second language, which is pretty impressive um, <laughs> that he wrote in English. Um, yeah. But it was primarily because it was his favorite book. But the book also is the source of all of our beer names. So every beer name we have comes from a, from a passage in the book. And then the art for the labels comes from those same passages uh, in the book. I, I love those ties because uh, the, 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 the artist that you had create these images uh, you, using, uh, I'm going to stumble through this, it, it, what appears to be simple colors, simple lines. There's like three or four colors per can, uh, per design. Mm -hmm. And it, you have basically simple lines that create this complex image is, is the best way I can uh, uh, sample that. So uh, for anyone who's listening or watching and wants to check it out, I mean, you can look it up online and I'll have uh, stuff in the show notes and on the webpage to see this, but it's just fantastic can art. Um, uh, why was that important to carry on the image and and the names uh, for beers? Was that just just because uh, simple uh, prag prag pragmatic decision to uh, because you could, or is there more meaning and story behind there? Uh, I mean, I think it, at the end of the day, this kind of falls back into it's his favorite book. Uh <laughs> Simple, simple. Yeah. Yeah. And it also, it gives the brand continuity, uh, and to some degree, almost like a terroir, right? It, because you're pulling from that book, which is, you know, 130 years old at this point in time, but yet it's still very relevant because it's been used in modern story adaptations now ever yeah. since. Well, and, and you're just keeping that, uh, that theme alive of the story or mm -hmm. of, of, uh, you're creating a little bit of mystery, uh, especially for those of us who haven't read the book or can't re remember the book. Uh, mm -hmm. Like I said, it's been a while, but uh, but there's there's a little bit of a, a mystery there. Um, uh, so, uh, but Heart of Darkness. The other thing too that I, I I noticed right away looking at the website. I mean, you're distributing around uh, Southeast Asia, but you're also s distributing to Australia and Finland. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, the old euro dollar situation and then the cost of shipping did shut down my Finnish operation, gotcha. um, at least temporarily. But, but you, uh, but you were, but you were. Yes, we were. It. Um, yeah, we were sending until about a year ago, uh, when the when the euro really went downhill and inflation went uphill. Sure. Um, and then we, it's not Australia but New Zealand. We have uh, it's a combination of shipment and then brew and market by Behemoth. Uh, okay, and, and uh, what was the what was the thought of sending it that far away from where you are and bypassing all the places in between? It, it, it seems like you would start in the middle and grow outward as opposed to kind of spot selling. Um, part of this is 
this is basically the reinstitution of the old global, uh, old, the old ballast point distribution network. It was a lot of the same people. Um, relationships. Relationships, exactly. There you go. Um, the other bit of it was just my, was mathematical. Um, the yen is weak. The KRW is weak. The Korean one. Um, so the math doesn't work. Uh, the euro, when we began the trade, did work. And also, actually, there is sort of a pecking order uh, within Asia where a lot of like North Asian countries don't necessarily like South Asian countries. They, mm -hmm. they perceive them as inferior, right, uh, from a product perspective. Whereas there is, if you go to Europe, where there's a lot of European beer that comes to Asia, there's very little Asian beer that comes back. But there's a massive amount of sort of uh, what Asia fusion and Asia infatuation even um, within particularly the northern European countries. So it made sense for them who have literally hundreds and hundreds of outlets that are very cool, sexy, chic, uh, Asia centric, Asia fusion bars and restaurants. But the only thing they had to pour was Asahi made in, in, in Europe. Yeah. Interesting. Um... Yeah, it's funny how that is. And I, I don't know the state of things, uh, but many, many years ago, I worked in the outdoor industry and I knew that that uh, uh, people in Japan were absolutely losing their minds on Patagonia gear and clothing and apparel. And and it was just like anything they could do to get that over there. Uh, what was the story on the street, at least at that point in time? And and so it's funny how those those those, those things occur. Now, was that is that is that a... Um, uh, a, a common thing or not a common thing, but is that a perpetual thing where there's always this interest in, uh, in Asian culture in these Northern European countries, or was that just a fad? Uh, no, I mean, if you look at who comes here as tourists um, in the normal world, <laughs> um, yeah. obviously yeah. we still don't have that with Russian airspace closed. Um, yeah. particularly the Scandinavians are amongst the biggest tourists to Thailand. Um, I mean, I went to the Swedish grocery store two days ago because I wanted some Swedish specialty items. Okay. Uh, so there is a very strong base. Uh, Southeast Asia is probably, it's not quite their Mexico. That would be more the Mediterranean, but it's certainly maybe more their Hawaii uh, where, you know, they come out here. They obviously have longer vacations uh, yep. as a general rule of thumb. Um, so they spend much more time here. They get to sort of know the, the foods and the cuisines. Maybe they can't handle the spice, but uh, they like the flavors. Well, <laughs> <laughs> and 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 hopefully, uh, I would imagine they're coming in particularly during the winter time and uh, bringing lots of sunblock with them too. I'm sure. Yeah, um, snowbirds. Yeah. Um, one of the other things too, I, I've got to ask you. You know, you specifically, but this kind of goes out to everyone in the world who uh, was born in one place, lives in another. Uh, what is your experience with uh, the expat? life and and why thailand versus other parts of the world well i've been an expat now since end of 2005 with spurts in the u.s uh i've lived in japan for about five years uh hong kong seoul um bangkok and now i built a house where i am um, it wasn't intentional japan was intentional i took japanese in high school uh some mm. in uni uh, that was very much an intentional move after law school. Uh, after that, it was sort of where opportunities fell. Uh, and when Constellation Ballast imploded, um, I didn't want to stay in Hong Kong looking for a job at an incredibly high cost of living. Yeah. Uh, and my wife slash I had a condo already in Bangkok. So we reload here to look for the next opportunity instead. Um, and, and the thing I, I love, I love the story. I love hearing iterations of the story. I've had other people on this podcast talk about, well, I was from here. I moved there. I thought this place needs a brewery. So here we are. Um, uh, how did that evolution come about? I mean, and I'll say this again for anyone listening, you know, I, I, I studied to be a brewer just so I'd have that knowledge, but I didn't want to be a full-time brewer. That just wasn't my calling. That being said, <laughs> if I ever considered being a brewer, it would have to be somewhere just amazing. 
uh, somewhere like tropical and warm and, you know, a place where people go on vacation. And that's where I'd plant my seed and my shovel and, and build a brewery. And th- th- I think that would be the only scenario where that would make sense to me. But, but you and other guests I've had have done that. Why? Um, I guess if we go way back to being in, in grad school, or law school, I didn't really, I wasn't that keen on staying in the U S. Um, and then when I moved to, to Japan for a language program at the end of law school, just to kind of like refresh my skills and see if I wanted to make that move, you know, I got to Tokyo and it was like, which was not my first time. It was like, yep, I'm moving. Like, yeah, I have, this is better for me. This works better. I like it better. The food's better. It's safer. It's infrastructure is great. Uh, and then I had to go about ways to find, uh, the ability to afford that, uh, but yeah, that was sort of the decision. And then after that, it was, that was really the only decision, right? That was a conscious effort to move internationally at whatever I was 29 or 30 years old. After that, it was basically opportunity driven. And at this stage of the game, I mean, I've been international sales side for 12, 13 years. If, if even if I wasn't in beer, I would still be perceived as the Asia guy. Right, having lived in markets, speaking some of the languages, knowing the customs, so it just becomes sort of your natural fit. Uh, would you? What advice would you give to anyone listening? Is like, God, you know, I've always wanted to go this place. Uh, what would you tell them? Uh, I mean, I if you really want to, language is key. Um, I mean, I wasn't as good as I should have been in Japanese. But if you really want to, well, I would say twofold. If you're manufa- if you're brewing side, it's less relevant, right? Because a brewery is kind of like a chef. You know, they get flown all around the world for restaurants that open up. And, sure. and the brewer market is the same way. I mean, our, our brewer sides have Brits and Kiwis uh, and Americans in the past. Uh, and that's pretty much universally true throughout most of Asia that there's uh, foreigners that are working on the brewery side. Sure. Um, on the sales side of the world, that gets harder. Uh, if you don't speak local language or the brewery doesn't have an international footprint, right? If you're just distributing locally in say Vietnam, you kind of need to speak Vietnamese. Fair um, enough. Logically enough. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I would say language and then also probably not coming into the, the world with this is how we do it in the U S because that's completely irrelevant. <laughs> Which is a common problem. <laughs> that often this is how we do in the U.S. You're welcome. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, I've seen that at many large corporations in the world, and they wonder why they don't succeed. Yeah, interesting. Um, so, getting back to where you are, um, you know, I, I, I'm the whole reason why we're talking. The fundamental reason why we're talking is just to explore the culture, yeah. uh, and 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 then the next step is to explore the drinking experience there, but. Uh, where you are uh, in Thailand and and just all of Southeast Asia, and I'm gonna I'm gonna lump them all together just for the sake of conversation. But I'd love to hear the nuances. But what is the cultural attitude and experience with alcohol and, and beer in particular? Um, there is, of course, definitely differences w- within the region. But Asia, as a general rule of thumb, uh, and that's just not Southeast Asia; that's North Asia as well is that food and alcohol are synonymous uh, versus the US where it's let's go to dinner and then let's go grab some beers or let's do happy hour and then go to dinner where the alcohol is kind of a freestanding component. Um, Most of Asia eats and drinks at the same time and they might do it for a long time uh, as in like many, many hours. Uh, But it's you don't go just for you don't go to a bar. Uh, There are bars, don't get me wrong. But you kind of go with a group of friends. Uh, you have snacky food the entire time. Uh, and then you're drinking beer or local distillate uh, the entire time. Uh, it tends to be more with your friends or coworkers. Coworkers is pretty common, especially more with the male side of the world, uh, where you go out with your company for dinner and drinks. Um, so it's, it, it is more of a, it's less, let's go drinking and versus let's go eating and drinking and let's go socializing with our group of friends. You, you, when you describe uh, that experience in contrast to the U.S., I, I can't tell you how many 
bars I've gone into with my uh, with my jobs, you know, selling beer or whatnot, you go in and you go in this, you know, uh, just a little uh, a quaint, wonderful little dive bar, and there's and there's Ed sitting at and his chair at the end of the bar having his his uh, tall glass full of clear liquid and full of ice cubes. It's two in the afternoon, and Ed's there every single uh, day that you that you walk in. That's 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 kind of normal to see in in certain situations to see someone go into a brewery and just have a beer or two and then and then head out you described that perfectly but what you're describing there in in thailand uh i've I've heard that uh, the similar story where it's it's about the overall experience we're going to add drinks paired with not paired with food but add drinks and food and conversation and 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 uh from your experience around the world is that is that a normal thing that happens outside the u.s uh the more westernized it is the the less it'll happen uh mm. i mean like you know, the scandinavian countries are going to be more like the u.s um i will say the australians probably have more fun drinking than the americans do uh because you know they're kind of like that loud boisterous group of people eating and drinking especially melbourne i'm, I'm a huge melbourne fan um but yeah i would there's definitely less people you know sitting on their phones checking their on tap scores um in the normal world of drinking obviously the craft beer bar is sure that's kind of universally the same but the average type of establishment it's just it's definitely much more social uh social drinking and eating i would say one i love that you just brought up that you know there are a few pe- fewer people on their phones checking their untapped scores um one of the things that i see and i've got a love hate relationship with this i'm very ambivalent is you walk into a place and there are TVs uh, and and a lot of places in the US there are TVs there are mm-hmm. bars that you know sports bars the whole point is the TV by the yeah. way you can have beer and wings um what is what is that like uh in in where you are uh, so our tap rooms don't have TVs, uh, they at least play sports. They have TVs that's menus, uh, but they, but we made a conscious decision to encourage conversation, uh, and not to have people watching TV. Um, I now, are you, are you talking about uh, heart of darkness brewery? Heart or of just, darkness tap rooms. Yeah. What, what, uh, and thank you for saying that, but what about, uh, just places in general in, in Southeast Asia? Uh, I would say. It tends to be more if it's a if it's a sports driven event or a Western style pub where you tend to watch sports, then it'll definitely have TVs. Uh, if it's not that, then probably no. Live music is very important, particularly in in in, in Thai uh, drinking going out culture, um, and then also the the type of establishments a little bit more. Ref- refines a bad choice of words maybe sexier is a better choice of words the because craft so? beer is ex, the craft beer is expensive right i mean okay it's it's more expensive in thailand than it is in say wisconsin where i went after nashville um because of taxes uh and the consumer base is middle upper class younger more female than the u.s um so it wants it's not quite full-on cocktail bar but it's it's more pushing towards you know refined um you know sexy dining and and very cool establishments that are like the dive bar alternative really isn't an alternative um it's it's served in again generalities uh in more higher end establishments uh, that have you know spent a lot of money on their their lighting and their fixtures and their accoutrements. Um, so it is a more it, it's a lifestyle product here, frankly, right? It, it's a product showing that you have international culture. You like a refined product, um, which is I would say a little bit different than the U.S. Is that to say that they just pay more attention to the nuances, like you mentioned, of lighting, of decor, of color, of of the food, of of how everything comes together? Am I off base, or is that what you're describing? I think they're they're paying more attention to it, but they're paying more attention to it because the price of a craft beer is five times the price of a Heineken. Um, 
And if that, you know, I mean, obviously knowing U.S. prices, if you were paying, you know, $6 for a Bud Light draft, which nobody does anymore in the U.S. in the last six weeks, but <laughs> you, if you were paying $30 for a craft tap, you'd want it to be served in a pretty darn cool place. Yeah, yeah. I mean, 30 bucks for a beer, it better blow my mind one way or the other. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of like the relative. I mean, uh, uh, maybe not quite that bad. Uh, you know, like a 500 mil, which is a glorified U.S. pint. Uh, mm -hmm. would be about yeah three and a half dollars equivalent in Bangkok of like Singha or Asahi or you know the like of that nature. A craft will probably be three times that. So you know it's a pretty big gap, uh, and and that's that's true in Vietnam as well. That's true in Malaysia as well. That's true in Taiwan as well. So if you are going to command that much of a of a price premium, and it's not that we commanded it's that the tax man mandates that's what the results are sure. um you kind of have to serve it in a manner that you know is justifiable to the consumer experience so what is the perception of of craft beer uh in thailand and beyond uh, is there just a perception of greater value because it is craft there's more attention it does cost more um or is it kind of an annoyance well, I mean, the price difference is a massive annoyance. Um, I mean, there, there was a new government elected last week in Thailand sitting in two months that is already looking at hopefully changing some of these policies. But in general, it'll never equivalent because of no matter how they change it, we're still going to have a problem. Sure, uh, sure. So I guess the answer to your question is we're stuck with the system. Um, the consumers view it, I would say, more along the lines of, oh boy, I mean, I love analogies. It's it's more along the lines of, you know, Burger King versus Ruth Chris, right? I mean, Burger King is macro beer. You, you can't afford Ruth Chris all the time, sure. but you go there because you are getting a great product, uh, better, better quality, more interesting. You just can't afford it every day. Sure. A special occasion type of situation. Yeah, it's a lot more special occasion. Obviously, it depends on your, you know, how much money you have in the bank account. But yeah. it, but you know, when the U.S. the price premium is only about 10, 15 percent. I mean, obviously, the the craft range goes much further, but you can definitely get you know good craft beer at you know nine ninety nine a six pack. Yeah. Um, that makes it a much easier reach. So, so you're, I mean, we're talking about the craft beer, but what is the state of the craft beer as a, as a overall business? Um, obviously we've got taxes and, yeah. and, uh, and costs that are really making it different, but, but, uh, you know, where are we in, in the state of, uh, craft beer in, in Thailand? Uh, we, I mean, sort of, again, let's ignore COVID as much as humanly possible. Sure. Um, yeah. Let's just pretend it didn't happen. God, wouldn't that be great? <laughs> wouldn't um, that be great? It's still growing. Uh, I mean, we're guesstimating, which is all we can get for, for data because it's kind of hard to pull. Uh, we're guesstimating that, say, Singapore is growing at about 10 or 12%. Thailand's growing at probably 10 to 12%. Vietnam's probably growing at, at around 10%. Uh, the overall craft beer market, or the overall beer markets are also growing in single digit numbers in most markets as well, unlike the US. Um, so it's definitely growing uh it's current market share everywhere is under one percent at the most 1.5 percent i would say so it's growing there's still room to grow uh you know it's still young i mean vietnam's first craft breweries were 2014 2015 oh wow um, thailand really just got their first craft breweries that can distribute in the last year because of changing regulations it's had import craft for a good decade um but it's all pretty new to the region compared to, you know, the U S and, and it's even, you know, five to 10 years behind North Asia. I mean, Japan deregulated in 96. So, you know, it's got, it's young. The consumer base is young again, outside of all of the annoying things around the world that are hurting consumer income and then discretionary spending. Uh, if things were peachy, they would definitely be spending more money on craft beer because it is new and exciting and cool and interesting still. What's your take on the, the, just the overall general quality, uh, you know, heart of darkness, notwithstanding, but the quality of the beer coming out of, uh, Southeast Asia compared to, well, let's just compare it to the U S for example. Uh, 
I would say, I mean, across the board, well, there's a lot of bad beer made in the U.S. too. I mean, to be yes. very honest. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, let's, be, let's be honest. Right. Uh, so I would say our biggest challenge is maybe less on the making it side and more on the keeping it in good condition side. Um, you know, it's currently you know, six 30 in the morning and I believe it's 92 degrees. Um, that's a problem for craft beer. Um, yeah, yeah. even if you are pasteurized, we are not currently, it's still a problem for craft beer when you're, when you run into hot temperatures all the time, it makes dispensing more difficult in terms of keeping your quality. Um, so the, our biggest challenge is probably the infrastructure behind the distribution to keep the beer tasting good all the way to the consumer's glass. Yeah. And, and I would imagine that it, it's, uh, the entire chain, uh, or the life of a beer after, uh, canning is it, uh, probably not all refrigerated. No, and it's not in the U S either. And that's the, that's, yeah. you know, I mean, when you get, I mean, we, you know, we are pretty much, our international is all cold up until the DC of the importer. Our domestic is cold delivery all the way through, uh, and if it's a non-premise account all the way through, but you know, mm -hmm. the second you want to be in a grocery store, you want to be in a C store, which is kind of where you need to be to sell volume. Yeah. You'll lose that control and there's yeah. nothing you can do about it. There's nothing you can do. Uh, wh what is the state of, of imports coming from Europe and the U S in there as well? I mean, is, is there a palette for those beers? Uh, you sound like you, you, you read my deck from CBC almost. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I didn't, the, but thank you. <laughs> okay. No, you're asking the questions that I was presenting on. Oh. Um, the like minds, the, uh, craft beer started for the most part around the world due to the importation of American craft. You can go that in, in almost every market, be that Korea or Sweden or any place. The U S was kind of the mother of, of craft beer. Um, you know, craft beer, American craft beer started showing up in Singapore, wow, 2011, 2012 with the usual suspects, uh, Anderson Valley, Rogue, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. um, Brewdog was obviously a big player in the region, still is. Um, U.S. craft has gone downhill a lot the last two years because the U.S. dollar has been very strong. Um, obviously, that makes the cost of goods relatively high. Um, the U.K. has been very weak. So BrewDog has actually been able to capitalize on that. The Aussie dollar has been very weak. So you're seeing a transition out of U.S. brands because of cost prohibition, for lack of better words. And importers are now moving towards European, Australian, Kiwi, and British brands because, it, frankly, it lands at the price that people will buy it at. And there's a lot of choice there, too, right? I mean, there's yeah. no shortage of breweries in those countries either. Yeah, and that's fair, and that's fundamental. I mean, I've 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 paid a, a a pretty dollar for some really nice beers, but that's not something I'm going to do all the time. Um, but uh, you know, doing what I do, I appreciate the really good stuff and willing to pay for it up to a point. I had a a a, a brewery uh, brew a Belgian quad, and they were selling the uh, it was uh, I think it was a 750 milliliter bottle, but they were selling it for 50 bucks. I was like, yeah, that's, that's a little too much. Yeah. That was, yeah, that's, that, that's almost past the California Cabernet. Uh, uh, price. Yeah. I honestly, it's like, you know, I, I can get a really darn nice, uh, Pinot Noir for, for that amount as well too. So I, mm. I will see. Um, uh, let's, let's talk about the, the beers you're producing the, and yes. the beers that, that, that really speak to the, the local flavor that speak to the culture. What, what are some of the flavors in the and uniqueness of these beers that are being produced in Southeast Asia? Well, interest. Okay. You, you'll probably find this be a bit surprised. Our number one selling beers are not local. They're uh, classic sort of styles of, you know, uh, multi-hop, be it American or Kiwi or Aussie, but, you know, mosaics and, um, you know, centennials and the numericals. Um, because again, that's a global commodity. Um, yeah. And, and really beer is a kind of a, a global culture. Uh, you know, I talked to, uh, uh, people from all over Europe and New England hazy IPAs are all the rage everywhere and awesome. Um, right. And they love making sours and things like yeah. mangoes, which clearly they've yeah. never seen a mango grow in Sweden before. Um, <laughs> so our, our flagship, which makes sense because our consumers, the majority of our consumers, of course, are local. 
Um, so they want really good, quote unquote, I guess we can call that normal craft beer, right? You know, like really good pale ales, really good IPAs, really good lagers, et cetera, et cetera. Classic, the classic stuff. Yeah, the classic stuff. Because, I mean, yeah. you know, if you're a, a, a fresh pale ale, it's going to be better than the, almost the same thing that's, you know, 12 weeks old, shipped across the world and blah, blah, blah with supply yeah. Um Now, when we go the other direction, um, then we actually do use more Asia uh, heritage because now all of a sudden, you know, when I put my pale ale into a market full of domestically made pale ales, now I lost interest, right? Yeah. So now what gets me interested or what gets people interested in me is, is using localized flavors and products. Um, you know, so to that side of the world, I mean, we've, we've recently come out with a lemongrass wit. Uh, oh. Like, which is yeah, I, I like softer uh, beers, okay. anyways. No, but that just sounds amazing. Just the I love that flavor of lemongrass. Yeah, I'm very pro lemongrass. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then when we do things outside, outside, like we'll be doing the Bruskeville Festival uh, in Helsingborg uh, in August, uh, which is one of the biggest invitationals in Europe. Um, and on that one, we're going heavy on Asia. We're looking at R and D things that are. Uh, sort of like the the sour mango with chili, which is how you eat it. Sour mango, chili, salt, sugar as a goza. Or yeah, Vietnamese okay. layered coffee, like the, the egg coffee. We're looking at things like that. We're looking at using local fruits for sours or, or for hazies. And so I would say that's where I answer your question. We have a lot of things to play with. Uh, and we play with them a lot on the, the seasonal side of the world or the like the, the very small batch stuff. Uh, for the local market, but then when we go more international, that's where we actually get to commercially use the cool things that are available in the Southeast Asia cupboard, so to speak. Well, and that, and to me, that just sounds fun because it, I can get a pale ale anywhere in the world, and that's not really going to, um, you know, I think about when I'm traveling, you know, I, I want, I want to get the t-shirt. I want to get the t-shirt that says, you know, I've been there. Mm -hmm. Not not to prove to people that I've been there, but when I go home from being there, I have that T-shirt that reminds me how fun, uh, how much fun I had when I was there. Mm -hmm. So when I so and I'm using that as an analogy, right? So, uh, but to go to, I mean, if you and I both met each other in Munich, I doubt mm -hmm. the last beer you and I would say, "Hey, I'll bet we could find a good IPA around here," right? Because that that's not the beer I want. I I want a taste of that local culture as, as much as I can while I'm in that local culture. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, when you talk about these lemongrass and these, uh, mango chili beers, it's like, I'm not going to find that here in the Northwest of the U S I'm not going to find it in the Southeast of the U S either. So to me, that's just exciting to me. That's a, that's a sense of place. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm a food guy. I mean, more than I'm a beer guy. So, I mean, when, when we get to start talking about recipes, like for these type of things, yeah. It's basically looking at it from a culinary perspective, right? Like what cool things that can we do that would make somebody be like, wow, this really kind of is Southeast Asia in a glass. That's perfect. Um, uh, and, and speaking of that, you, that you, you're the king of segues uh, today. Um, you know, what is the, a common pairing with, with some of these beers that are endemic to, to Southeast Asia, what do you expect to pair them either with food or even an activity? Uh, you know, what, what's a great combination there? Uh, I would, well, I mean, if we're talking like the formal pairing game, I mean, we can always play that game, but, um, to me, I've never been, I mean, I've done many a pairing dinner and I mean, I think there's has a purpose, but I, I also tend to like Pinot Noir with, with salmon. So, I mean, whatever. Uh, <laughs> hey, right on. If right, you like it, enjoy it. So, nothing yeah. wrong with that. Uh, I would say there is, there, there's two types of drinkers. Well, I mean, there's more than that. But there's sort of the, you want something light and, and quaffable because you, oftentimes you're drinking outside. Uh, and when you're drinking outside, it's obviously hot, mm -hmm. um, even at night. Um, so lighter beers do very well, um, you know, heavy beers, uh, be they perceptively heavy, like stouts and whatnot, you know, you're, when it's 95 degrees out, you're sitting outside and you're eating whatever you're eating, a stout's probably not the place that you, most people want to go. Um, 
so it it tends to be more on the lower ABV, like sort of like the European style, like you know four mm -hmm. and a half to six percent is really the big sweet spot. Yeah, um, absolutely. The double IPA only really has a place with you know that very niche drinker. Um, it tends to still be an IPA market, but it's more like again more like the European IPA market, uh, where it's you know it's more lower ABV, lower IBU. Uh, because it is hot. Um, you know, if you look at like where, I mean, everything, everybody in Asia likes grilled things, right? I mean, obviously, yakiniku, Korean barbecue. Uh, the Vietnamese love to do that with seafood. Thailand loves to do that with, with seafood and meats. Uh, you know, that's obviously a great dining environment to begin with as well. So, I mean, I've always thought that's a good place for pale ales uh, and, and, and nice flavorful lagers. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and then the, I guess the other bit too, is a lot of places in craft beer tend to serve American style food, right? Pizzas and, or the German style pizzas, sausages, chicken, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Uh, well, in which well, case, let me ask you even, even beyond beer, uh, like, uh, mm -hmm. endemic, uh, beer and food pairings. I mean, what other things are, are just like ideal pairing for a beer? I mean, you're going to go golfing in a minute. You and I met talking about diving. Granted, mm -hmm. we're not going to have a beer while we're diving, but afterwards it's fair game. What are some of these things that are that that are just really you know known for that area that are just perfect with the beer? Well, I mean, I would say music is huge because live music is is, is huge yeah. in, in in Southeast Asia, like you know the venue that plays live music. Uh, I mean, I've obviously love. I think most people do uh, beaches. Um, yeah. That probably screams light lager, uh, but. Yeah, not, I mean, always. <laughs> not always. <laughs> not always. Not uh, always. But you know, beaches, music, um, food. I mean, just eating, right? Yeah. I mean, you, it's it, it. People love to go out and eat and drink, and I think that's because people eat every day, right? They eat multiple times every day. The yeah. Southeast Asia, it's just, it's also a snacking culture, right? I mean, if you've ever been, there's either food carts or shops that serve little snacky foods constantly. So you're always kind of like just a, a moment away from a snack. Uh, and when you have a snack, you know, I think that kind of leads to having a beverage sometimes. Yeah. Especially, uh, I, I would imagine that some of these snacks tend to be a little bit on the salty side to encourage uh, oh. a drink. Yeah. I, I mean, Thais tend to either be really, really sweet, desserty, or a lovely combination of salty and spicy. Yeah. which is good for beer. That's great for beer. Um, so I, I'm going to use myself as a proxy, but I have never been to Asia, but uh, I'm yeah. going to use myself as a proxy to other people who have never been there. But if we were to come uh, to where you are and, and for a visit, go to Heart of Darkness and visit mm -hmm. the, the, the rest of the, the area, mm -hmm. what kind of experience would, would we expect? To, we well, go out, grab a beer, and grab something to eat, and we're staying a couple of days. What what can we expect? Um, I think the answer is probably not what you would expect coming into it. Uh, I think that you would be surprised by the diversity of the foods available um, and the quality of the foods available. Um, I think that you would be surprised that you would be going to places that may look like a hole in the wall in some cases. Uh, and would definitely not clear U.S. food safety standards um, <laughs> that can deliver amazing meals. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think you'd be surprised by the loud is not the best choice of word, but there's a vibrancy in Asia that is pretty much gone from most of the U.S. with the exception of maybe parts of New York City uh, where, you know, things are just happening. Right. I mean, there's it's, it's a cacophony literally uh you know there's i mean bangkok's a city of approximately 18 million people uh vietnam's got a population of pushing 100 million uh thailand's like 70 million so you're talking really big cities with a lot of people eating all kinds of different things um from the street level sitting on a chair underneath an umbrella uh with you know grandma cooking something on a stick on the on the grill all the way to uh, well, I mean, Bangkok has, I believe, the third most Michelin stars of any city. Uh, I yeah, I think it's third most. I believe it's Paris, 
Tokyo, Bangkok for for Michelin stars. So like wow. whatever you want to go, whatever like range of the perspective or spectrum you want to go to, it's here. Fascinating. Um, uh, I mean, you had me at diving. You just kind of filled in all the gaps. Uh, uh, we got good diving too. Huh? Uh, yeah, <laughs> Some of the well, best in the world. Well, and it, it, it's, uh, you know, in my earlier days, and I think about college, I just had this uh, desire to go to Latin and South America and it's mm. still on my bucket list. And and so so Asia just wasn't on my radar. Not really. I, I wanted to go south, not east. But but. But the, but the more that I uh, spend time in beer and food and, and even looking at water sports, because that's my other life, uh, Thailand always pops up on the, whichever radar, uh, yep. no matter what it is. Whoever I'm talking to, Thailand usually comes up in conversation. And so it is definitely on the radar now. So I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, uh, coming through and doing some uh, quality assurance and some of the beers at Heart of Darkness. But um, Absolutely. Um, when... Uh, uh, well, another bef before we kind of wind down, another big question I, I want to ask you and ask everyone is from your perspective, your international perspective, your food loving, your beer loving perspective. You know, what's important to you when you think about trying to define and deliver a great beer experience? I think that. I mean, for one thing, I think that the we need to be very careful about pushing uh onto the craft consumer too much in the sense that we all have different tastes right everybody's got a different taste uh and you don't have to like a new england ipa to be a craft guy you can be a light pale ale guy or a lager guy right so i mean i think we we, we need to come into this which with uh, a much more open mind uh and let the consumers travel the experience of craft beer uh educate them absolutely right tell them why this is different than that tell them you know how this product is better than not say better is a better choice of words but how this product has things that this one doesn't have particularly if we go macro versus craft but you know let people truly experience this for themselves um and don't talk at them be a resource yeah um and then i would say just you know really encourage Go back to the U.S. 20 years ago, right? 20 years ago, the U.S. was about experiencing craft beer and trying to find better beer versus trying to find novel beer. Um, and we, were far less, we were far less elite about it 20 years ago. Correct. And when it went elitism, it frankly got, it turned a lot of people off. Um, so I, was, I, th I think that's the biggest thing. It's just be an educational resource, but let's not, be overly douchey is a terrible choice of words, but let's not, let's I, not. I, I was thinking the same word. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I know, but it, it, has to, it does have a purpose, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah and, 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 you know, let's talk about, because craft beer doesn't mean quality, which is a terrible yeah. thing, right? I mean, it's if you supposed look at, to, but it doesn't. It doesn't. And even U.S. market research shows that. So let's change the, the conversation about and talk about quality and talk about flavors and talk about pairings and then and then create that that experience where where you are sitting in this little place in the back alley of of saigon eating grilled goat and you had a phenomenal pale ale with it and now you are like forever embedded in that relationship as a beer educator i absolutely love that answer um uh, I, I've had some really amazing meals in some uh, kind of uh, uh, expensive places. Luckily, I wasn't putting the bill. But you, the ones that when we when we kind of think about our highlight reel, when I all, during my when I talk to people, I think about or I ask them to think about the dinners, the evenings, the events that you will never forget so long as you live. Mm -hmm. When I play that highlight reel in my mind, it's not those fancy dinners. It's not the uh, hundred dollar Oso Buco at in uh, on the Las Vegas Strip. It was that tiny little place off Strip that you weren't sure if you should be there if you're going to make it alive that night. But it was the experience was so positive and so memorable mm -hmm. that that you compare everything else to that from from here on out. Yeah, and a lot of it has to do with who you're with, right? I yeah. mean, because beer is again a social lubricant um 
and it's who you're with, where you're at, and what you had with it, and that's going to to define that memory. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Um, I, I absolutely 100% agree with that. Um, <clears throat> so let, let's begin our wind down uh, 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 process. Uh, we're just some fun questions, but they're a little bit yep. thoughtful as much as you want them to be. But uh, tomorrow, thank you for your service. Uh, we are promoting you to the king of the beer world for uh, for one day. On that on that uh, on that royal day, what's the first thing you would change about the world of beer? Oh, I mean, from a business perspective, taxes. <laughs> I'd sell a lot more. If it it's was... not the first time I've heard that answer. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say taxes would be would be number one because that would make my life so much easier where I sell the most the majority of my beer. <laughs> Great. Um, and one of these days, I am not very tax savvy. I need to have someone come onto the podcast and, and just kind of lay that all out for people. And it's just, I, I hear that all the time of just the, the access, the cost. It, it just, it, it's a, it's a thing that needs to be dealt with apparently. Yeah. Well, I mean, regulation's never fun, right? And, it, it's are, necessary to a point, but it's just when we go beyond that yeah, point, that's when it becomes a and problem. Craft breweries are small. So it's like, I mean, you have to dedicate a lot of resources to regulatory and tax. Yeah, you know, that's not something that, you know, we don't have that good corporate finance department like AV InBev does. Yeah. <laughs> that can find all those loopholes. Yeah. Uh, or, 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 the, uh, or the might, the uh, financial might to uh, get things done. Wink, wink. Exactly. <laughs> um. Okay, so on this royal day, at the very end of your royal day, uh, we thank you for your service. We're going to send you anywhere on earth to have uh, whatever beer and whatever food. Where where would you go and what would you have? Uh, back to Tokyo, Izakaya, and I am probably going to have an ebisu with my yakitari. Uh, a what? Ebisu is uh, it's Sapporo's premium line in Japan. Hmm. Um, just absolutely lovely, rich beers that lagers that go perfectly with grilled chicken hearts with a little bit of salt and a little bit of uh, togarashi, the Japanese seven pepper. Um, I've had a lot of them over the years, <laughs> uh, but there's but again, you, you were saying like, you know, experiences yeah. and relationships. Uh, if we're going to close out a perfect day, it's my, one of my old Izakayas I've been going to for 20 years um, with eight or nine seats, uh, talking to the owner, proprietor and chef and just being like, ah, this is a good day. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, next big one is why does good beer matter so much to you? I would say it matters because I want to maximize my ROI. I, I want to get, I want to get the best that money can buy for what I'm willing to spend. It doesn't really matter what it is, what, what product category. Um, I would, you know, I would much rather have one really good steak versus five terrible ones. Um, I think the same holds true with anything. It's, it's a flight to quality and less away from quantity also keeps you a little bit healthier. That is both wonderfully romantic and pragmatic at the same time. I, that I'm not sure how you managed to squish those two things together, but, uh, not bad I, for 7am, like, right? <laughs> I, yeah, I, I know. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're well rested apparently much more than me. Um, for anyone who wants to learn more about heart of darkness, uh, and, and, and just learn more about, you know, the beer in Southeast Asia, where could they go to connect? Uh, I would say there is a Asia Brews News uh, is a good place to look at. Uh, that's the the news network of the of Charles Guerrier, who is sort of like the CBC of Asia's founder. Uh, used to be called Seabrew is the event. Now I believe it's called Asia. It just changed. It changed names and I've yet to embrace the new name after eight years. Uh, <laughs> it, it happens. Back it in happens. our day, it was, it was, we, we were happy. Yeah. So I would say that's a good sort of like macro resource. I mean, Facebook is obviously much is king still within region. You know, look at the different breweries. There's a lot of, I mean, I'm in craft beer groups in Thailand, Vietnam, Japan, Korea. Uh, you, 
the ones that you have to apply for, but it's not like they say no. Yeah. Um, that's probably a good resource. Um, yeah, and just perusing the old the old internet. I mean, festivals we have them again, um, so that's cool. Um, and just yeah, I would say in, first come here, and then see how beer is in the environment, and then you know, if you want to chase locations, of course we all know the internet's a great resource for finding like craft beer bars and things like that. Great. And, and then the very last thing is the stage is yours. You're talking to professionals and enthusiasts around the world. What would you say to them? I would say keep your head up because it's going to be a cup. It's going to be a challenge. Uh, you know, the, the last three years weren't great. And then the next year or two may have its own issues. But I think to the professionals, I think we really need to focus on, on selling quality, uh, moving away from novelty. Uh, I think that the consumers I'm seeing in, in my consumer base, a moderation of what they want to want to drink. I mean, they want things that are quaffable. They want them good, but they, they don't want nine and a half percent. Um, so I would say let's focus on the beers that they want to drink. Let's focus on explaining quality and let's in, connect to the consumer on the sort of emotional level uh with stories and with re relationships and with pairings of circumstances like you know occasions um and let's expand the customer base i mean that's one thing i noticed about the us it's still the same guys it was 10 years ago it's mostly guys are just 10 years older um you know the consumers here much more female much younger uh so let's embrace the not just the liquid but let's embrace lifestyle um and you know it's turn craft beer from craft beer into where it should have been the entire time which is premium super premium i i think that's perfect it, it should be an experience it should be something better uh, you know i i've told people this before i'll tell them again beer is something that no one needs but almost everyone wants so let's mm -hmm. not pretend it's something that we can't live without that life without it would suck, but it, but it's something that is meant to enhance our life. So let's grab something good and create something great with it. Yeah. And tell, I mean, it's my old boss at Ballast told me it's, uh, tell stories. Tell and stories. That's because that's beer has the most emotional commitment by the consumer base it's it's basically irrational but other products don't have that scotch doesn't have that wine doesn't have it i mean there's something about beer that the consumer really feels an attachment that's an emotional attachment um so let's understand that and and help to create that with our brands that's perfect and what a great way to end as well um, I'm so glad we met. I'm glad we had this uh, conversations that you and I have had. Um, and I cannot wait someday to uh, get my butt over and over there uh, in uh, maybe go spearfishing, grab our own, uh, grab our own food and then uh, toast afterwards. But, um, but thank you for what you're doing. And thank you for sharing your stories and for coming on to the podcast. Absolutely. Been a, a complete pleasure. A very good random running each other on the deck on uh, at the mice place in Nashville. And uh, thank you for doing this on your evening and uh, absolutely a pleasure, sir. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. What do you think about when it comes to Southeast Asia? I've never been, but I'll admit that craft beer does not come to mind for me. However, that's all changing. For those who love to dive, love the food and the people, now we'll have a good beer to pair with all of it. In the next episode, we follow our guide into the world of fermentation in the craft beer culture of France. I'm on a virtual tour of the craft and culture of beer around the globe. I've put Good Beer Matters on video so I can take you along for the ride. If you know of a person, a place, or a beer story that needs to be told, let me know. Meanwhile, grab a beer hang out with friends, and let your world open up. Thank you for listening. Cheers.